Hello, this is Daniel Raymond, the voice behind Ray's Guide. In a recent video, I coined the term hogfighting to describe fighting with the goal of getting away rather than winning, which is dogfighting. And I described a sample technique with that aim, what I call the joust and jam. And I thought that going further and describing how it works might be a good launching point to talk about other things about our verse, such as how it does and doesn't conform to Newtonian laws of motion, how decoupled mode works, which many new players don't understand, and why it is occasionally very useful. First on the plus side, when our ships are in space, they generally at low speeds obey the first law of motion. Now, when sitting still, they stay sitting still. When moving, they stay moving in a straight line. And it takes thrust to get them to change their motion. This makes Sir Isaac Newton happy. But sometimes it doesn't seem like it does. Push the D key to straight to the right, and as soon as you release the D key, your ship slowly returns to stationary, even though there should be no friction to slow it down. You normally don't have to push the A key to counteract that motion like the first law of motion says you should. You would think that this would make Sir Isaac Newton sad, but it doesn't, because it is presumed that your ship's computer essentially pressed the A key for you and applied the countering thrust. And in fact, look at the external view, and there it is, the countering thrust automatically applied by the ship's systems. And if your maneuvering thrusters are broken, things can go very badly. The presumed piece of software in your ship is the Intelligent Flight Control System, or IFCS which functions like most present-day fly-by-wire systems. In coupled mode, your inputs are communicating the desired motion, and the IFCS changes that to the necessary thrust. In decoupled mode, your commands specify thrust, and you have to manage those thrusts to get you to actually going the way you want, which can be a little tricky. But the biggest impact of this is the ability to face in one direction while moving in another. You see an IFCS coupled mode, if you point your ship in one direction, the IFCS presumes that you want to move in that direction, and will start to calculate and apply canceling thrust to any other direction of motion, plus if you have a set speed, to add thrust to get you to that speed in that direction. Now, in decoupled mode, changing how you are pointing without applying any thrust just changes how you are pointing. Note that decoupled mode still has the IFCS system automatically applying countering thrusts on pitch, yaw, and roll because otherwise getting completely out of control is way too easy. Also among the things that would make Sir Isaac Newton happy is the fact that planets and moons have gravity in proportion to their size. But what makes Sir Isaac Newton angry is that gravity seems to disappear once you're out of the atmosphere and you don't have to worry about orbital speeds or the planet or moon pulling you in. If you want to get a feel of how important this actually is, I would suggest taking some time to play Kerbal Space Program or Flight of Nova, both very good games. But Chris Roberts' games have always, just like the Star Wars movies, emphasized the fun of freewheeling joystick acrobatics rather than having to worry about whether your acceleration is prograde or retrograde. And that's fine. But when you are up there above the planet describing how realistic the flight model is in orbit, an actual physicist would be laughing their asses off. And this desire to emphasize the joystick jockeying, plus recognizing that graphics engines have trouble handling high relative velocities of objects, leads to the fact that each of our ships has an absolute maximum speed in space relative to some arbitrary zero reference. And this has Sir Isaac Newton wanting to demonstrate linear acceleration by hurling that damn apple right at your head. This has nothing, absolutely nothing about it that is realistic. Neither that there is an absolute speed short of approaching the speed of light, but then we're talking about that other guy, nor that there is some sort of zero point in space that maximum speed is a reference to. But that's just the way it is. You fight with the game physics that you were given, not the ones that might actually have this be realistic. So let's get to the specific example of the Joust and Jam, and let's make an extreme one-on-one -on -one example for simplicity. A solo Hercules C2 and a Gladius. Now in my previous video I said that for Joust and Jam, the hogfighter should mount energy weapons so that the dogfighter couldn't just wear down their supply of ammunition. I should have also included that the energy weapons should be of the longest range possible in the size class, 
because you don't want to create the ability for the dogfighter to use their superior maneuverability to stay in the range where they can hit you, but you can't hit them. So the joust part of the joust and jam is simply to get the dogfighter into a chase position, as they would say, on your six. And unless they have figured out what the hogfighter is up to, most dogfighters will not mind getting on your six because in atmospheric flight, that is the most vulnerable position. Also, as an aside, if the C2 had a second crew member, the rear is better armed in the front, which emphasizes that any hogfight or dogfight tactic needs to be adjusted for the ship and crew. Now, the C2 gets as rapidly as possible to its maximum speed of 963 meters per second, which using boost is pretty soon, and then switches to decoupled mode and stays at that speed simply by doing nothing, but only pitching and yawing and around. They can then pivot around decoupled and now their 6 is their 12, while still moving in the other direction. Now here's the thing, whatever the Gladius does with its 1236 maximum speed, it has to vector 963 of it to match the speed of the C2, or it's falling behind again, possibly fast. So the Gladius now has a net relative maximum speed of 273 meters per second. Not much. 273 meters per second is difficult to get in enough angular change to not be easily targeted and led by the gimbling gun on the pivoting C2. Yes, by taking a long time, the Gladius could get ahead of the C2 again while staying out of range, and then have a single fast pass at the C2 before falling behind again. But it will be slow, and likely have the Gladius pilot will run out of hull points, ammunition, patience, or perhaps all three. Sure, the Gladius will have no trouble then leaving safely when that happens, but remember that in hogfighting, surviving the attack is a standard of success. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking to yourself, yes, but what if the Gladius does uh, this? Or what if there are two Gladii? Or what if it isn't a Gladius, but an Ares? Or a Talon Shrike using missiles? And that's good. That's imagination. That's creativity. Having an always-win tactic for anybody. It's boring. And truth be told, we are all going to be going back to our tactical drawing boards whenever CIG implements the new master mode system that they are developing for Squadron 42. Now for an update on our giveaways. First, we have the 10,000 subscriber giveaway for the LTI Hall C, the colossal cargo container carrying craft to be given away when the sea goes live, and the big annual ship giveaway for the winner's choice of the Galaxy Complete, the massive modular mining moving medical machine, or the Banu Big Box Bargain Bazaar, also known as the Merchantman. One entry per video for both giveaways. Just be a member and be entered automatically, or otherwise be a subscriber and comment somehow including the secret word. And the secret word for this video is the thing that Sir Isaac Newton won to hit your head instead of his. Fly safe, keep it real, and I'll see you in the verse. This is Daniel Raymond for Ray's Guide.